What a sound. What a band. We're Great glad song. to be here. We're oh, glad man. to be here. Thanks for having us. Marty, so glad you're here. Marty Stewart, welcome. Uh, and what an amazing, amazing journey you've had. Uh, I touched on some of the early stuff, but I wonder, was there a time when you were a kid with, that you heard a song on the radio or you went to a show or you heard something that just made you go, okay, that's it. I'm going to do it. I'm going I'm to play music for the rest of my life. Uh, well, the first two records I ever owned in my life was a Lester Flatt and Earl Scruggs record and a Johnny Cash record. And the only two jobs I've ever had in my life was with Lester Flatt and Johnny Cash. <laughs> but um, so, so imprinting early actually matters. It, yeah. it, it did. <laughs> and um, Johnny Cash came to the uh, Coliseum in Jackson, Mississippi. I think it was in 1970. And my mom uh, took it, me and my sister to see that show. And when he walked out on stage and said, hello, I'm Johnny Cash, I, that was it. I was like, I'm in. That's wow. what I'm going to do. Wow. Wow. And then I'm trying to imagine... You know, as a, as a teenager, getting to play music with the Sullivans and others, but then also just getting to be in Lester's band, the Nashville Grass, um, your parents must have really been supportive. Did they buy you your first guitar? I, my mom worked at a bank, <laughs> and so that helped. Uh, <laughs> she she, she co-signed a loan with me. And she was, my mom was a very uh, astute business gal. And so she said, you need to learn to be responsible. So she co-signed a loan with me uh, for my first Fender guitar. And I had to cut yards that summer to pay for it. And I sold Hall Hallmark greedy cards up and down the road. But uh, that's how I paid it off. Yeah. yeah. So she, she taught you a lesson. Yeah. Now, um, I understand there was a scene that you, one of your early records was about the Busy Bee Cafe. What was that, what was that place like? My town uh, was a wonderful place in the South to grow up, and I love Philadelphia, still do. Uh, but in, you might remember 1964, that's where the three civil rights workers were murdered. And um, it, the world just turned upside down, and the whole town was judged by you know, a handful of racists and radicals. But uh, that was not the Philadelphia that I knew. But in my opinion, the coolest place in that town was this uh, place called the Busy Bee Cafe, and it was a, a black-owned establishment but it had um it had a, it was a shoe shine parlor it was a juke joint and it was a cafe and i thought the guys that hung out there were the coolest guys in town they dressed like about like we do now and <laughs> and uh, some of them had gold teeth and that was my goal in life at that point was to look like those guys and have a gold tooth so, <laughs> so the busy bee cafe yeah. was it kind of made an indelible mark on me yeah and when you were growing up, I mean, given the fact that that was the early days of this whole civil rights movement, were you aware of this division? Was your town segregated? Was there white drinking fountains and colored drinking fountains and that stuff around you when you were a kid that you were paying I'm attention to? I'm sure there to? was, but I didn't notice it. My, yeah. my mom taught love. Uh, and, um, the thing, but the thing, I felt it the most in the churches because churches were being bombed and people were, you know, blowing up people. Right. And uh, so people were taking uh, baseball bats and knives and guns to church just to feel like they had to protect themselves. So the world was crazy yeah. at that point. But, you know, I always felt like music was the, was the thing that, that made everything okay. And the first time that I was ever absolutely stunned by the power of music, my dad was a factory worker, and uh, Saturday afternoons was our time together. And so we would watch country music television shows that we shared a love for that came out of Nashville, those 30-minute syndicated shows. Uh, Flatten and Scruggs, Wilburn Brothers, and Porter Wagner. Mm -hmm. And when during the, the midst of all that stuff, uh, that crisis, uh, the Porter Wagner show came on. And all of a sudden, here's these rhinestone suits, and there's happiness. And it was like, you know, country cousins coming to town in Dolly Parton. And, uh, you know, just good, happy music. And when they would go off the air, there was almost like a tangible heaviness that came back. And that's the first time that I ever realized how powerful music could be in lifting people's spirits. Yeah. Now, you were involved with playing bluegrass mostly in those days, and you were playing uh, with the Sullivan family for a while. How did you meet Roland White? On the bluegrass circuit, that's yeah. where I met you. Um, the bluegrass music circuit, as you know, is one of the greatest places in the world yeah. to get your wheels up and to get to know people. And um, Roland was uh, in Lester Flatt's band when I was working with the Sullivan family gospel singers. And he was very approachable. He, you know, was very kind to me. He gave me a guitar, a mandolin pick, one of his scarves. And, uh, but what he really gave me was his phone number and said, sometimes, you know, if you ever get a chance, talk to your mom and dad. I'll talk to Lester. Maybe you could ride along with us for, 
for the weekend or something. And let me just let people know that Roland White was, had been in a band called the Kentucky Colonels that was a really important sort of seminal, really one of the first sort of young, young kids playing bluegrass in a new way. And he and his brother Clarence were just kind of changing people's minds and hearts and blowing their minds. And, and here he was playing in Lester's band and giving you his phone number. That's right. And uh, I went back to, after touring with the Sullivan family, I was like 12. And I discovered <laughs> our circuit that summer was like bluegrass festivals, uh, revival meetings, uh, camp meeting revivals, uh, and uh, George Wallace campaign rallies. <laughs> so, but that summer I discovered applause and I could stay up all night and talk about music 24 hours a day and hang out with people like you that were cool and just, you know, had a bohemian lifestyle and girls and I got paid a little bit for it. And when it came time to go to school, I was a pitiful excuse for a student. <laughs> and I felt like the circus had dropped me off at the edge of town. You know? <laughs> and so I got kicked out of school about a weekend. And I called Roller and I said, man, this would be a good time to call. <laughs> and, so, and so it worked out that I could go up for the weekend and turn into a career. Yeah. And that was four, when you were 14 or 13. 13. Yeah. And, uh, and your parents basically handed you to Roland White and said, okay, here's, here's our boy. Look out for him. He's now on a bus traveling with a bunch of experienced, wizened uh, veterans. And uh, you're out there. At, you know, he was your minder kind of, wasn't he? I don't think it would have worked out with the Ozzy Osbourne band. Yeah. You know, but, <laughs> but Lester was like a country preacher of sorts, you know. And so he, they had a meeting. And so um, the reality sunk in after a couple of weeks. Uh, they had a meeting, my folks in Lester Flat, and my sister was there. And um, they talked about how, you, how would you finish your schoolwork. You know, your, your money goes back to Mississippi. You get to keep enough to live on. Here's how much you get paid at the Grand Ole Opry. Here's how much you pay for recording sessions. It was laid out pretty straight. Wow. And so I told Lester, I said, well, I'll tell you what, I'll be back next Thursday. He says, no, we go to work tomorrow morning. And so there was a long road out of that bluegrass festival. My mom and dad's car was in front. And there was dust coming up out of Alabama, you know. And when it came to the main road, my mom and dad's car went this way, and my little sister was going like this, and our bus went that way. I went, whoa, I got the job. <laughs> it's heavy. I got to show you something that I bought from the record table back in those days. <laughs> Lester Flatt and the Nashville Grass fan book. I look like Donny Osmond. <laughs> <laughs> And it was, that was during that time when everybody wore a lot of feathers on their head. Oh, don't look at me, you guys. You started it out here. It looked like, it looked like birds flew into my head. <laughs> so what do, what do most people not know about Lester Flat that you learned in those years when you were in that band? Well, I didn't know. I thought he probably went to Harvard or something. But Lester had a third grade education. And what I learned was he was the wisest man I've ever worked with. He, he absolutely... Um, his wisdom. I learned the difference in wisdom and, and school knowledge sometimes. There yeah. is a difference. Yeah. And uh, when it, they both exist, that's the best. But uh, his principles of life, his principles of uh, show business have carried me, you know, for 45 years now. Yeah. He's never been wrong. Yeah. And he had a beautiful way of welcoming people, making people, people feel comfortable as they're being entertained. I mean, really unique in that way. What a great teacher. Well, if you look, go back and look, if you've never seen any of those, especially those Flatt and Scruggs films on YouTube, you can see the, the old Martha White television shows. That came along at a time when, uh, you know, rock and roll had basically, you know, put a big dent in country music's business. But the Flatt and Scruggs model, they were, they were happy, there was integrity, there was dignity, and, you know, the musicianship and the entertainment factor was just kind of off the chart. And it taught me that, you know, when you, when you do things from those standards, if you can, it's an evergreen source because when I go back, we, we, so we watch them in the bus sometimes, and it inspires us. We always play a better show after we see them. Oh, that's cool. They were great. Right. And so after that, next stop pretty shortly thereafter was Johnny Cash's band. Yeah. Well, Lester had passed away, and uh, I needed a job. And nobody in bluegrass music needed, you know, a musician at that time. And so I went into um, a guitar store in Nashville called the Old Time Pick and Parlor. Remember that place? Yeah. And there was a guy named Danny Farrington, who was a luthier, yeah. guitar building builder. a really fancy black guitar. And I said, who's that for? He said, Johnny Cash. I went, I want to go with you to meet Johnny Cash when you deliver that guitar. And I kept up with the progress of the guitar. And when the day came, we went to uh, Cowboy Jack Clement's studio in Nashville. And I didn't know it when the door swung open. I met two lifelong friends. The first time I ever laid eyes on him, Cowboy Jack Clement, who was a great record producer at Sun Records, 
I was dancing with a martini on his head, and Johnny Cash was singing the Wabash Cannonball. And I thought, all right, I can hang out here with my kind of people. And, so, and I was introduced, and John stood up, and he, and he stuck out his hand and said, what's your name? I said, Marty Stewart. He said, where you been? I said, no, he said, where are you from? I said, Mississippi. He said, I thought so. He said, uh, where you been? I said, getting ready. He said, all right. And we hung out all day, and about two or three weeks later, I got a call, and they said, John wants you to come to work with us. And so I didn't audition. I just showed up and started playing. Wow. Mm -hmm. Wow. How long did it take for you to become his son-in-law? Long enough. Yeah. <laughs> and it didn't last long. No. <laughs> I think they called me old number nine. <laughs> I didn't know that Cindy was John's daughter when I first laid eyes on her. She was a pretty girl, beautiful girl. And the next thing I know, I'm dating the boss's daughter. I'm going, oh, no. But uh, he was used to it. Um, <laughs> the best one of that, if you've had Rodney Crowell on this oh, show. Yeah. Did he tell you the story about going to Jamaica with Roseanne? No. Here's Johnny Cash right here. So, and Rodney tells this story, so I don't feel bad about telling it. So Rodney and Roseanne Cash uh, were, were dating. They were living in California, living that groovy lifestyle. So uh, when they went to the cash home in Jamaica for Christmas, came time to go to bed, and John says, uh, Roseanne, you're over here, and Rodney, you're over here. And Roseanne says, well, I, I dad said, no, so we, we live together. And says, we don't think it would be um, honest if we didn't do our thing down here. And John says, well, you can do your thing where you want to, but you're not going to do it in my house. And Rodney thought, I'll just stand up and take up for myself. And I said something really big to John. And John said, son, I don't know you well enough to miss you. <laughs> so that's about what he was used to, knuckleheads like me and Rodney. There's that, that, that wisdom again. The coolest uh, thing that ever came out of that is at the... Toward the end of June Carter's life, she called me one day and said, Honey, I want to talk to you, So I said, Yes, ma'am. She says, I want to start a band. I went, Okay, what can I do to help you? She says, I want to call it June Carter and her ex son in laws, and I want it to be you and Rodney and Nick Lowe. I went, All right. It'd be a pretty good band, actually. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> hey, in case you just tuned in, you're listening to E Town. I'm here with Marty Stewart. Uh, those are some pretty good Johnny Cash stories. Uh, and there's so many great stories. I want to just kind of, we've got a lot of music to get to, too, and we could do this for a long time. But I was in Nashville, I don't know, eight years ago or 10 years ago, and I went to a museum that's kind of over by the War Memorial Auditorium. Maybe it's called the Tennessee Museum. I don't know what it's called. But it was full of your stuff. It was a collection of uh, country music memorabilia that all belonged to you. And it was an amazing, amazing collection. When did you start getting that? interest when did you start collecting stuff like that in the beginning as just simply as a fan when our artists would come through philadelphia mississippi uh i'd buy an album get them to sign it or eight by ten glossies or ask the band member for a guitar pick or whatever but uh, and i always kind of had an eye toward that because all of those people's things those people that raised me when i went to work with lester i wasn't old enough to drive so I had, everywhere I went, I had to go with him. So all of a sudden, my peers were Roy Acuff and Grandpa Jones and String Bean and Bill Monroe and those, those level of characters. And whether they were playing um, poker or in a studio or on stage or at a cafe, it all looked really important to me. It looked like history in motion. And um, so their artifacts in the early 80s, when the Urban Cowboy Scare came through Nashville... <laughs> Uh, you know, they started getting kind of um, thrown away. They started uh, appearing in thrift stores. They started appearing in yard sales, and they were just getting lost. And it looked to me like it, the family jewels were being thrown away and disrespected. And due to my age and the way I looked, you know, I was kind of a part of both worlds. That world had raised me, and I was trying to make music to get a job on the other side. But uh, what really brought it home was I was in a junk store in Nashville on 8th Avenue one day. And there was this really cool-looking hand-tooled leather train case. And I went up to look at it, and it said Patsy Cline on it. And I opened the lid, and it had her address in there. And I put a blanket over it, and, it, and I called her husband. I said, Charlie, where did you guys live in Madison, Tennessee? And I, he told me the street. I said, thanks. And so I went up and set it up on the counter and asked this lady. I said, what can you do on this? She said, $75. And so that's a perfect example. The costumes the artifacts, the treasures, the manuscripts, 
uh, the personal effects of all those people, the master architects, yeah. kings and queens of country music, they were just basically being discarded. And it looked wrong to me. And I got really serious about a self-appointed mission. It started in my bedroom, and then it went from there to you know a little warehouse and warehouses, and then it became like 20,000 pieces. It's pretty stout. Yeah. And among those 20,000 pieces, I've got the insurance bill to prove it, I promise. Yeah. yeah. You've got a guitar that used to belong to both Hank Williams and Johnny Cash. You've got uh, a guitar that used to, was the main guitar for, that Clarence White played. Mm -hmm. That's your main guitar that you play now mm -hmm. that you call Clarence, right? And uh, Hank Williams' uh, handwritten lyrics to I Saw the Light and uh, Cold Cold Heart, Johnny Cash's first black suit, the boots Patsy Cline was wearing when she lost her life. It's, it's, it's all Smithsonian level kind of things. Yeah, yeah. What's the biggest thing you own? Do you own, you own any buses? No. <laughs> uh, the biggest thing, I don't know. Everything's not that big. Not that big. I tried to buy Merle Haggard's bus not long ago, but it wasn't for sale. <laughs> and what are you going to do with it? Is it going to wind up in some permanent location someplace? In the state of Mississippi, home state. Um, there's a museum trail. There's a, if you go down to Mississippi, you'll see the blues trail. There's a country music trail that we got established. But uh, there's also an informal museum trail. And the spiritual home of rock and roll is uh, the Elvis Presley birthplace in Tupelo. Uh, Mr. B.B. King's place over in Indianola, Mississippi is the kind of the spiritual home of the blues. There's a museum in Clarksdale up in the North State. Uh, the Grammy uh, organization just put in a beautiful museum on the campus of Delta State. But my archives now live in my hometown of Philadelphia, Mississippi, and uh, the property has now been uh, purchased. The boards are in place. It's about to be fundraising time, and Marty Stewart's Congress of Country Music Hall will be the spiritual home of country music in the state wow. of Mississippi. Wow. That's where the thing. So wow. come visit. Come visit. It's an amazing, amazing collection. Listen, I got to do just quickly touch on a couple things. One is tell me what you told your mom when you were a teenager and you went to a Connie Smith show? Connie Smith, my wife, legendary country singer. She was mama's favorite singer. She came to the Choctaw Indian Fair in my hometown uh, in 1970. And that was a big day for us. And uh, my sister and me, we, we, we prepared. It was like we couldn't sleep at night waiting for her to come to town. And I took, had my mom take me to the Seward's department store that day and buy me a yellow shirt so Connie Smith would notice me. <laughs> And uh, how old were you at the time? Twelve. Twelve. Yeah. And uh, <laughs> you got to dream big, folks. <laughs> so at the end of the concert, we went down onto the football field where she had sung, and me and my sister Jennifer, we got our picture made with Connie. I got her autograph, and uh, she didn't notice me. And uh, I asked my mom if I could borrow her camera, and I went back and found Connie, and I said, "Miss Smith, can I take your picture?" She said, "Sure." And so that was the first picture I ever took in my life. And on the way home that night, I said, I'm going to marry Connie Smith one day. And uh, this past Sunday, we just celebrated our 20th wedding anniversary. <laughs> Why not? And as I understand it, you got married on, at, uh, up at Pine Ridge. Pine Ridge. I love, the Na I love the Lakota people. Went up there for the first time in the early 80s, and I fell in love with them and just never quit going back. So we wanted to go to a very spiritual place and a very special place. So we were married on a dirt road in a buffalo pasture. And uh, it sounds exotic, doesn't it? <laughs> but uh, it worked for us, and we were happy to do it. Yeah, and you were there yesterday. So they, what, do you, what, what do you do when you go up there now? Well, it's like hanging out with family. Yeah. Uh, we filmed a video on that song we just sang called Time Don't Wait. Uh, we would, uh, did a video and incorporated all manners of uh, you know, people from Pine Ridge had kids dancing around us in their beautiful costumes. And um, it's the first time rhinestone suits in Native American style ever came together, and I thought it worked just fine. <laughs> it was pretty cool. That's awesome. Well, listen, I, I want to just, you know, this could go on a long time, and I'm really thrilled that you're here. I just want you to know that uh, as I look around the landscape of music that I care about, and I, you know, think about whether it's the Staples Singers or Johnny Cash or Clarence White or Willie Nelson, Merle Haggard, Doc Watson, Bill Monroe, all these roads connect you to those people. And uh, it must be an amazing feeling to have lived the life you've lived already and still to be so active and engaged, but have those memories, those connections, those relationships 
with so many legends, so many icons, and well-deserved because you were making music with these people. Well, I, in a sense, I, I learned something from every, from every one of them. They passed on something to me. And I was, and I was taught at a very early age. Uh, I used to wonder, why did Lester Flatt hire me? It was like, it'd be like hiring a 13-year-old chimpanzee to come on your bus, you know? <laughs> but it's like he saw something in me that I didn't see, and he passed it on to me, and it became a responsibility, and then a love, and then it was a responsibility and a love for sharing it with young artists. I love seeing Cassandra up here. And I, that, Connie and I watch for young artists. We love passing it on and encouraging. Yeah. But I got to tell you, all those roads that lead to me, they would be about that much were it not for Kenny Vaughn and Harry Stinson and Chris Scruggs. I'm telling you, it's the band of a lifetime. They're no brothers. Yeah. They make they make going to work wonderful every day. Yeah. Well I just one of the reasons we were able to make this happen is that we were both playing at a festival not too long ago and I was just knocked out by the band again and just thought, man, we've got to make this happen. And so here you are. Glad it worked out. Honest, glad to be here. Yeah. Thank you, Nick. Let's get back to music. Welcome back. Marty Stewart, his fabulous superlatives. Hi, this is Nick Forster from E-Town. If you want to stay up to date with all the performances, interviews, and behind-the-scenes footage, click the subscribe button. Thanks. <laughs>